the strait. I found Van Mickey's daughter interesting because it seems to me to stage the conjuncture of Mutu's concerns for the capacity for emotional rapport between human subjects and the inclusion of same-sex subject, same loving subjects alongside the insistence and possibly the over-insistence of the real world of Trinidad. And I should say that um, I think people who've read her other work have found this one quite difficult to read. I don't know how many people have read it here. Um, but it's marked by an excess of materiality and detail. It's kind of hyper-real. And I think it's kind of self-conscious, a very highly self-conscious aesthetic, perhaps even an aesthetic of anxiety that finds itself writing place in a way that's too highly charged just to gesture to be, being there, belonging there. So it's very much a, a novel about Trinidad that, rather than just a novel set in Trinidad. But I think what Muti does in this novel is to bring together the imagined and the hoped for. And in her case, the imagined and the hoped for is is um, reciprocity, emotional rapport, tolerance, acceptance, uh, a kind of ability to love as you wish to love, um, self-definition obviously of sexuality and the freedom to express desires without fear or reproach. She, so she brings that, the, her, the force of her imagination of a social world into encounter with the real, the socially defined and experiential world of contemporary Trinidad. And what comes out of that encounter between the imagined and the real, I think is a very locally sensitive idea of sexual citizenship that accounts for a complex matrix of human relations that guarantee a rewarding life. So that the right to be yourself is always in active dialogue with, your care, with the care and respect you have for others. In this way, the narrative both participates in the project of reimagining social possibilities and it asks us to acknowledge how our, those ideals, often inscribed around individual rights and entitlements, might need to be negotiated around the happiness and emotional security of wider sites of identity, such as home, family, community. In other words, I think Van Mickey's daughter's struggling to find a way to think what it might mean to love and to live in the Caribbean. And we all know that Mutu you know, felt in many ways she couldn't live there. I see it as important in its exploration of the possible, not as enthralling and inspiring as the utopian creation of new families or the magic, real, magic realist imaginings of other worlds, and not as depressing as the homogenizing of the representation of relentless exclusion, hostility, and violence. In other words, Van Mickey's daughter seems to me somewhere another foothold, somewhere in between the dance hall and Sirius. It's messy, it's compromised, but it isn't about identities forged through daily encounter, through actually the process of living a life. I'm not, I don't mean to suggest here that Mutu invests in and endorses social rules, far from it, but neither does she wish away their grip on us as subjects, whose structures, if not substance of connections, are made within units like the family, and most importantly with a desire for living together. And obviously, the, the failures of which have consistently undermined the potential of, of Trinidad to be or to, to generate the idea of the people. What's interesting about Valmiki's daughter is that those who are least able to make the transition between the lives they live in order to conform to others' desires and the lives they desire to live are not necessarily those with the least social power. And that's, I think, important because we were very consciously thinking about sexual mobility always being available for those with most social power. But in this text, it's something a little bit different. What stops people just asserting their rights and, and saying, I'm going to live the life I want to live, is actually their capacity for sympathetic mimicry, their, their capacity for empathy, that they recognize the stakes of claiming their identities for those around them. In this way, Valmiki's daughter brings into visibility a significant point of tension for Caribbean queer subjects between the large ethical projects of movements such as, say, post-colonialism or gay rights. Those movements say, you know, we must imagine more rewarding, equal, self-determined rights. We must deliver the social conditions which make those possible. And perhaps another 
urgent and demanding political project, which is to construct mutually supportive set of relationships that feed into the idea of a people. If we believe it's through that idea of the people that we can affect socially impacting change. So by working in an almost exaggerated realist register, the novel still offers the hoped for and the imaginable, although such moments are only glimpsed and snatched. The queer intimacies of the book are lyrically very present, although often socially under threat. But I think they do, there is enough there to summon a different meeting point between aesthetics and ethics, an excitement, a rush, at taking hold of Trinidad from a queer perspective. For Viveka, the moments when living and loving do come together are both cherished but always slightly compromised. There's lots of almost kisses, lots of touching of lips, lots of touching of fingertips. It's immensely erotically charged with be with that while being barely sexual. And I'm sure that this is also partly to do with the concern that, you know, um, the, the sexualization of, of, of queer subjects, that somehow, you know, sex is what they are, sex is what they do. So she has all of this kind of erotic charge. Um, so this is just a tiny extract. If her parents were to find out that she had such feelings for a woman, if Nyan were to know that his wife made her dizzy like this, again, the social sort of parameters, but most of all, she imagined Anique and herself in the house in Rio Clara, with doors and windows closed and no prying eyes around. They would lower themselves onto the floor of the kitchen, and she would lie there with Anique, holding her face, stroking her hair, and kissing her mouth. It's in these moments that the reader experiences the force or lift of Mutu's writing, where the possible itself changes shape, and where our apprehensions are rearranged in such a way that all of those seemingly historical and cultural guarantees of the impossible, of same-sex attachment, of loving, intimacy, and life, they sort of lift up, and they're never really fully persuasive or adequate again. In other words, the, the novel kind of offers a wedge into something that can't then be prized shut. Well, this novel is not in any way a ready-made gay narrative. There's no coming out story. It does, I think, uncover a Caribbean queerness that may be no less radical for being quiet rather than noisy, turbulent rather than resolved, anticipatory rather than completed, and invested in social density rather than surface rights. So to conclude then, I guess it's my argument that in Valmiki's Daughter and many other literary texts, texts that have nothing like the noisy reception and attention that's given to the dance hall, but these texts allow us to see how reality is not only susceptible to being re-described, but also to being reinterpreted. To borrow the words of the queer theorist Judith Butler, my conceptualization of the conceptualization of the caro Caribbean queer, then, is a new way of, of reading for sexuality that, as she says, allows us to imagine ourselves and others otherwise. It establishes the possible in excess of the real. It points elsewhere, and when it is embodied, it brings elsewhere home. Thank you.